me a favor, please, and stand for just a moment. Take a deep breath. You've been sitting here for a while. You're going to sit here a little while. Uh, of the earth, he sits enthroned. You must know this quote from the Ministry of Healing if you're going to really engage in the last day. Because this is not a day for the weak part. This is not a day for the compromiser. This is not a day for the weak. Be strong in the Lord, says the word. But above the distractions of the earth, he sits enthroned. All things are open to his divine survey. And from his great and calm eternity, he orders that which his providence sees best. You may not like some of the things I say today, but I hope you won't forget that. Write it down, Ministry of Healing, page 417. Commit it to memory. It will keep you in good stead. I have so many quotes here to, to use today. And what have I done with my glasses? Oh, there they are. I lost glasses yesterday. I think I've already lost them again. Oh, there they are. I read this quote from that was written in 1904. Now, I love history. When I see that date, 1904, that's when volume 8 was written of the testimonies. I think what was happening in America then? It's fascinating. What she, when she wrote what she wrote, it was so relevant to her day and ours as well. She wrote these words. The solemn messages that have been given in their order in the Revelation are to occupy second and third place. No, first place. First place. <clears throat> Whoa. So many friends that I have, I don't understand Revelation, I don't want to engage Revelation. I don't fully understand Revelation either. If I did, I'd understand God more completely, and I'm not God. But we can know a lot more than we do. The solemn messages that have been given in their order in the Revelation are to occupy first place in the minds of God's people. Nothing else is to be allowed to engross our attention. I first met Raymond about 30 years ago. 
And I can't honestly say that we got along. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you the last two or three years of his life, we talked two or three times a week. That's what brothers do, is they communicate. And I'm looking forward to what God has in store. Let us pray. Father in heaven, they read this marvelous passage of the great apostle to the believers in Thessalonica. But they're more relevant to us today than when he wrote them almost 2,000 years ago. Help us, Lord, to be awake to the times. But may the times not distract, or distract us from the reality that Christ our righteousness is what will see us through. Mm -hmm. A couple of weeks ago, a Jewish rabbi in these words. He said, he wrote, humanity is being divided into two distinct groups. Is that true? Yes. With an ever shrinking gray area in the middle. There are many differences between these two groups. But the, fun, the most fundamental difference is that one side attracts people who fear God, truly fear Him, and the other does not. What does Scripture say? The fear of God is the what? Beginning the beginning of wisdom. That's what we're talking about here. He goes on and he says, there are certainly religious people on the other side. There's no shortage of religious leaders of every denomination. Now this is where it gets a little dicey, but I'm just repeating his words. There's, there's no shortage of religious leader, liberty, leaders of every denomination who support forcibly injecting people with a vaccine and dehumanizing those who resist. These people are indispensable. <laughs> These people are indispensable to the anti-God side. For evil to really thrive, it needs a kosher stamp. He goes on and on and on. I'll share the whole paper with you later today if you would, you would like. Back to the Apostle Paul. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Please note it carefully. <clears throat> but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. I've already taught you this. Brothers and sisters, there's too much ignorance among us, and I'm speaking about myself, that see what's going on is no big deal. This too shall pass, and life will continue on peace and safety. That's more than foolish. It's evil. You have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as they labor pains upon a pregnant woman. That's something we guys can't fully relate to. Well, let's believe our wives, okay? <laughs> and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, as that day should overtake you as a thief. Therefore, let us not sleep, as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet of the hope of salvation. I 
I can stop right there. Amen. <laughs> but I want you to turn now to Revelation chapter 14. If you will, please. As I said, I got two or three sermons, and I'm kind of mixing and matching here a little bit. But may God lead. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 14. We used to call these the three angels' message. Now we call them almost a distraction. I saw an essay the other day on the three angels' message, and I never could find the three angels' message in the essay. I won't tell you where, but you can figure it out. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. And then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. This is our message, having the what? Wasn't that a beautiful children's story of the everlasting gospel? And then God in His mercy, 30 years roughly in the Laodiceanism. That's what Ellen White said in the 1850s, that we're in Laodicea. Is she not? 1850s. We weren't even organized as a church then. But about 30 years into that, God sent a marvelous refinement, if I may use that word, Ron. A marvelous refinement on the gospel through the, through the messages of Jones Wagner and I always add white. Amen. The everlasting gospel is unchanged. Unchanged. Having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Let me add something right here. That word everlasting just left off the page. I think one of the reasons why we're so blind these days is that we've accepted the notion of unconditional love. I don't think the Bible or Ellen ever used that term. The term is everlasting love. It's not unconditional. It's everlasting. It's okay. Okay. It's everlasting. Praise God. To preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, say with a loud voice, Fear God. And it goes back to the old rabbi. Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. I love that. Not will come, but has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. i got a question for you. you know, how do you know Babylon has fallen if you don't really know what Babylon is? That's, right. yeah. That's where I'm struggling right now. I'm not sure we really know who Babylon is. Right. Babylon is. Babylon is not stuck in the Vatican. Babylon is here. Fallen that great city which she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Remember, there's only two groups. There's only two groups in the final analysis. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, and Raymond liked to quote this. At least a comment on it, and I'll get to that. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or where else? We'll talk about that a little bit more. Ellen commenting on this said that this is the most fearsome message ever delivered to mankind. And if we don't deliver it in love, it's on our heads. He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out with full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. We serve a wonderful, nice, kind God, but he will punish wickedness. And I will not accept this milquetoast God that I'm hearing more and more and more. Amen. And there's brilliant people that are that are resting those 
words and turning them into something that I don't see anywhere in Scripture. And in the presence of the Lamb and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever sees the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Hallelujah. Here are they, here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And this next one's for Raymond 2, verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, Blessed are the day who die in the Lord from now on. Amen. Amen. All of us stand or sit here looking forward to seeing somebody in addition to Jesus. My daddy died over 60 years ago. Over 60 years. Just a little boy. My mama died 40 years ago. Looking forward to seeing them. Blessed are those who die in the Lord. Who die in the Lord. <coughs> Yes, many of the thoughts that I'm sharing as I work through this are the result of many hours of discussion with my brother and friend. He would also, he would often correct me with scripture. Or Ellen or Jones. A corrective. He'd love to give a reference point. A corrective. A benchmark. An anchor to the conclusion we would reach of the times in which we were living. For me, I was often out of left field, out, of, out from left field, not so with Raymond. My objective today, if I had to, could just nail it down to one. And when I use this word Laodicea, see Dale Martin's at the core of it, okay? Laodicea is not out there, it's in here. Amen. My objective today is for Laodicea to wake up and repent for our redemption is nearer than when we first believed. Amen. You know, I appreciate the Sabbath school very much this morning in this discussion of the word we need to trust the Lord. But Stacy and I have been talking about another, another layer of that, if I'm not a higher one, but just another layer. And that is the word come. You know, when Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are what? And are heavy laden. And the greatest burden we carry is the burden of sin, Ellen wrote. Because when Laodicea finally wakes up and repents, then there's going to be a final generation who reflect the goodness and fullness of God. Praise God. Praise God. Yes, the two of the books that are listed on that uh, bibliography were written by one of the men sitting here in this church. The return of the latter rain and wounded in, wounded, wounded in the house of his friends. But Ron, I can't I can't think about Jesus coming without thinking, being rebuked of how much I've delayed it. Mm -hmm. I resent the, the, the notion that, here I'm resenting a lot right now, mm -hmm. the notion that, oh, Jesus is going to come on his own time. Mm -hmm. If we wounded Jesus in the house of his friends in the 1880s and 1890s, like Ellen said, then we are the delayers. Oh, but I've heard people say, oh, Dale, aren't you glad he didn't come? You wouldn't have been born. That is categorically selfish. Categorically selfish. Yes. As I read Ellen White in the turn of the 20th century, Volume 8, Volume 9, Acts of the Apostles, those great books. She saw the wars coming in the 20th century if God's people didn't repent and wake up. No, brothers and sisters, the carnage of the 100 million deaths in the 20th century is on Laodicea. 
I'm going to say that again. The carnage of a hundred million dead, unnecessary deaths, usually by tyrants, in the 20th century is on Laodicea. Because there's no eighth church. God's going to fix it. But we've got to let Him fix it. Amen. hundred million deaths. Now, this is primarily just from Marxism and fascism. Now think about it. The entire population of California, the entire population of Texas, the entire population of Florida, and the entire population of Georgia. That's about a hundred million. If that doesn't sober you, you're not sober at all. What did Paul say in 1 Thessalonians? Be sober. Be sober. Yes, as I've read, more and more thinkers, not of our faith, are recognizing that the world, in addition to our faith, I should add, are recognizing that the world is being divided into only two groups. Stacy and I support an orphanage down in Chihuahua that's operated by Mennonites. Marvelous place. Love to tell you about it. But one of the principles of it is stated our place twice out in West Texas. And you all are welcome if you can get there. <laughs> we live out in the middle of nowhere. Can you imagine this in the side? Can you imagine a county bigger than Volusia with only 2,200 people? <laughs> Stacy asked me a couple. I asked Stacy. Uh, I think I asked you. You asked me. And over at the beach, if you had your choice of living at the beach or in the mountains, which would you choose? I said, hands down, I choose the mountains. Why? Because it's quiet. <laughs> This is a noisy world. And it's really getting noisy in this world. It's quiet. It's quiet. It's quiet. Yes. Two groups. This Benny was Benny used to be the man I'm telling you about, the Mennonite, used to be the pastor of a mega church. He says, Dale, we're just getting split. Two groups. Two groups. Just like there's two, only two genders, there's only two groups. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. We have a good friend, not of our faith in South Carolina, whose niece goes to the University of Wisconsin. She was telling him, how many was it? 62 genders on the forms they can check. One of 62. Well, I'm here to tell you, there's still only two groups. <laughs> Just like there's only going to be those who are for Christ and those who are against Christ. Amen. You know, it's interesting. You say what you want to about Dante, that Catholic thinker, scholar. But he said in his uh, circles of hell, he says, the hottest fires are for those who try to remain neutral. Amen. That was 800 years ago. Yes, there's no question in my mind that 21st century Laodicea, remember that's me, even more than 20th century Laodicea has mastered neutrality. Boy, did we see it in the last 18, almost two years. We have mastered neutrality. Or the bane of true Christianity Maybe we're mastering popularity and prosperity. So that they're more important than principle. Mm. To be blunt, it's no longer wise or useful to keep both eyes on the papacy waiting for the big one. I said both eyes. While the enemy steals a march. Raymond and I used to talk about this a lot. He said, in fact, he's the one that coined this first, and now the doctor. He said, we're kind of like a man standing in, the, in his living room looking at the picture windows. He's in his bathroom looking at the picture window through the binoculars, waiting for the big one while the big one is coming in from behind. It's exactly what's happening in my humble opinion. 
Remember, this pulpit is not infallible. God is. Amen. So as I used to say when I pastored many years ago, I said, don't believe a word I say. You test me by the word. Amen. You test me by the word. Yes, I'm going to say that again. We've become like a guy in the bathroom with binoculars looking through the picture window for the big bad wolf while he's already in the house. As Laodicea slumbers on. Oh, but Dale, didn't you hear that General Michael Flynn a few days ago called for one nation under God and then he reinterpreted it as one religion under God? Yes, I heard that. And it is troubling. It's as troubling as a pesky chihuahua that will nip at your heels and even draw blood while a wolf is in the house. Yeah, there's a greater tyranny. It's a worldwide tyranny. The book of Revelation calls it the monster from the abyss. Ellen White said that when the horrors of the French Revolution was, lo was uh, loosed upon that part of Europe, she said this was a new manifestation of satanic evil. Yes, Paul says that every knee is going to bow, but most will be bowing before God when it's too late. Mm -hmm. Too many are bowing before the tyranny of the self. Raymond and I started thinking of talking about this a couple of years ago that we believe that only a small minority of the recipients of the mark, the big one, the big one, and it is going to be a big one, but only a small minority will receive the mark in the forehead. The vast majority will receive it in the hand. Mm -hmm. The hand of expediency, the hand of compromise, the hand that feels good, the hand that, the hand that pursues safety and security over faithfulness and principle. You see, go with me to Revelation 13. I'm going to try to finish as soon as I can after 30, but I'm not going to say which time zone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Revelation 13. Because lunch is here. Yes. We, if you've been in Adventist for more than 30 minutes, you've heard of Revelation 13. Revelation 13, you remember, has two beasts. The first one is called a leopard-like beast. He's a really bad guy, right? But note that a beast refers to a kingdom, a nation. And we often forget this, and I'm kind of digressing, but forgive me because I'm running two or three together here. We often forget that the, the wound was not given to the woman on the beast. It was given to the beast itself. Are you clear on that? All right, that's clear. We're good. We're good. And um, just for those who may not have heard that one before, because we often think that the wound was delivered to the woman or the beast. No, it's delivered to the beast. It means that the beast was taken away from her. And that's exactly what Berthier's general, Berthier, General Berthier did when he was sitting by the when he was sent over to Rome by the directory, those five men who kind of replaced the well, they were Jacobins, they were just offshoots of Robespierre. That he went over there to say to, to, to rip the Pope away from the government. Oh, you can run the church, but you're not going to run the government. That's us. So that's the beast. And they got the deadly wound. And it's praise God for America and its principles that has kept that woman off that beast. That's right. Thank you. Are you clear on that? Yes. Get a little, you know, I believe in being angry but not sinning, but I don't always find that. <laughs> where that balance is. It should make you upset when people are trashing this principles of this founding, yes. this founding principles of this country. And I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. But, let, but, but notice, uh, chapter 13. The second beast is us, right? Okay, still with me? 
first beast, let's just read down through it. And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And